So, if I may start by insulting your intelligence with what is called the most elementary lesson. The thing that we should have learned before we learned 1, 2, 3 and ABC, that somehow was overlooked. Now, this lesson is quite simply this, that any experience that we have through our senses, whether of sound or of light or of touch, is a vibration. And a vibration has two aspects, one called on and the other called off. Vibration is, seems to be propagated in waves and every wave system has crests and it has troughs. And so life is a system of now you see it, now you don't. And these two aspects always go together. For example, sound is not pure sound. It is a rapid alternation of sound and silence. And that's simply the way things are. Only you must remember that the crest and the trough of a wave are inseparable. Nobody ever saw crests without troughs or troughs without crests, just as you don't encounter in life people with fronts but no backs. Just as you don't encounter a coin that has a heads but no tails. And although the heads and the tails, the fronts and the backs, the positives and the negatives are different, they're at the same time one. And one has to get used fundamentally to the notion that different things can be inseparable. That what is explicitly two can at the same time be implicitly one. If you forget that, very funny things happen. If therefore we forget, you see, that black and white are inseparable, and that existence is constituted equivalently by being and non-being, then we get scared. And we have to play a game called, uh-oh, black might win. And once we get into the fear that black, the negative side, might win, we are compelled to play the game, but white must win. And from that start all our troubles. Because, you see, the human awareness is a very odd mechanism. I don't think mechanism is quite the right word, but it'll do for the moment. That is to say, we have as a species specialized in a certain kind of awareness, which we call conscious attention. And by this, we have the faculty of examining the details of life very closely. We can restrict our gaze, and it corresponds somewhat to the peripheral field, I mean the, the central field of vision in the eyes. We have central vision, we have peripheral vision. Central vision is that which we use for reading, for all sorts of close work, and it's like using a spotlight, whereas peripheral vision is more like using a floodlight. Now, civilization and civilized human beings for maybe 5,000 years, maybe much longer, have learned to specialize in concentrated attention. Even if a person's attention span is short, he is, as it were, wavering his spotlight over many fields. The price which we pay for specialization in conscious attention is ignorance of everything outside its field. I would rather say ignorance than ignorance because if you concentrate on a figure you tend to ignore the background. You tend therefore to see the world in a disintegrated aspect. You take separate things and events seriously imagining that these really do exist when actually they have the same kind of existence as an individual's interpretation of a Rorschach plot. They're what you make out of it. In fact, our physical world is a system of inseparable differences. Everything exists with 
everything else. But we contrive not to notice that, because what we notice is what is noteworthy. And we notice it in terms of notations. Numbers, words, images. What is notable, noteworthy, notated, noticed is what appears to us to be significant and the rest is ignored as insignificant. And as a result of that, we select from the total input that goes to our senses only a very small fraction. And this causes us to believe that we are separate beings isolated by the boundary of the epidermis from the rest of the world. You see, this is also the mechanism involved in not noticing that black and white go together. Not noticing that every inside has an outside and that the inside, what's inside, goes on inside your skin is inseparable from what goes on outside your skin. You see that, uh, for example, in the science of ecology, one learns that a human being is not an organism in an environment, but is an organism hyphen environment. That is to say, a unified field of behavior. If you describe carefully the behavior of any organism, you cannot do so without at the same time describing the behavior of the environment. And by that you know that you've got a new entity of study. You are describing the behavior of a unified field. But you must be very careful indeed not to fall into old Newtonian assumptions about the billiard ball nature of the universe. The organism is not the puppet of the environment. Being pushed around by it. Nor on the other hand, is the environment the puppet of the organism being pushed around by the organism. The relationship between them is, to use John Dewey's word, transactional. The transaction being a situation like buying and selling, in which there is no buying unless somebody sells and no selling unless somebody buys. So that fundamental relationship between ourselves and the world which is in an old-fashioned way by people such as Skinner, who, have not, who has not updated his philosophy, interpreted in terms of Newtonian mechanics. He interprets the organism <laughs> as something determined by the total environment. He doesn't see that in a more modern way of talking about it, we're simply describing a unified field of behavior <laughs> which is nothing more than what any mystic ever said. That's a dirty word uh, in the modern academic scientific environment. But um, if a mystic is one who is sensibly or even sensuously aware of his inseparability as an individual from the total existing universe, he is simply a person who has become sensible, aware through his senses of the way ecologists see the world. So when I'm in academic circles, I don't talk about mystical experience, I talk about ecological awareness.